It's always good to be in the house of the Lord with people that love Jesus. Amen. <laughs> we have to travel a lot in the old world out there, and uh, there's a lot of them that don't love Jesus that we have to deal with every day. That's what's so awesome about being in the house of the Lord. I was thinking when Brian was talking about tithing and giving, I thought, I'm glad I don't have to pay dollar for dollar every blessing that God has given in my life because I'd be bankrupt. <laughs> People say, well, you don't have to tithe. I said, you're right. You don't have to do nothing, but you get to. And if you do, God is faithful to do exceedingly above and beyond all that you can ask or think or believe. Sometimes people say to me, say, oh, all you churches, all you want is our money. You know what I tell them? I said, that's not true. We want your money. We want you. We want your kids. We want your time. We want your energy. God wants everything that you are. Amen. And you know, some people just tithe and that's it. God wants more than that. We all have different gifts and abilities. And a few weeks ago, we had a Appalachian Service Project team that took off and went down south and used their gifts and their talents and ability. And I'm going to ask you, if you were on that trip, I want you to come up to the platform real quick. Amen. Would you do that? Come on up. All right. All of them may not be here. Yep. I just thought it'd be good if you just maybe share a little word of testimony about maybe some of the divine appointments that you had. Appalachian Service Project is a ministry that goes to needy areas in the country. Um, and in particular, they go there and they do all kinds of housing projects. I believe they built a, uh, what was it, a ramp or a porch or something that you built? A ramp and a porch. All right, you know what you're talking about, so I'm gonna let you talk. Who wants to start first? You want to start first, Captain? You'll finish up. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. My name is Mark. Um, I just, all I could say is that uh, the, the hardest thing I ever had to do, uh, I've done a lot of amazing things in my life, but um, lately I've just been letting my flesh get out of the way. And I think that's a very important thing with this trip for me. Um, just let go. Um, if you want to see the power of God, if you want to have God in your life, you just have to let go of this flesh. And it's no hard, it's no easy thing. It, it, it's very difficult. And you got to take that first step, and then, then amazing things can and will happen. And, and you got to go by faith. Uh, it, it was just a revelation. It was. I, I just can't put it, the experience in words. If you've never done it, definitely um, make it a point to get out of your zone, get out of your flesh, and just go for it. Well, I was told I only had a few minutes, so <laughs> I won't tell you everything that happened to me on that trip, but God's still working. Um, I do want to challenge anybody if they, they think they can't afford to go or anything else. We can raise money. We, you know, if you've got the time, you've got the energy, if you can hammer a nail, if you can pick up a board, that's all we want. We just want people to go. We'll find something for you to do. You know, there's plenty to be done. But, you know, just I went to work. That was my goal. It wasn't God's. I met a young man that um, has put me on a journey. And God has healed so much there. And then we, this week, again, and today, this morning, again, and um, healing, healing and healing after healing after healing. My God is good. to um, an 83-year-old lady's house and tore down steps and rebuilt a 5 by 10 deck and an 8-foot st steps. She didn't know she was getting a ramp, I mean a deck, so she was all excited because she thought she was just getting steps that she couldn't go out. 
because she can't go down them. So we built a deck and she was all excited. It was a joy to see how excited she was. We, Jenny and I did all kinds of things and the other people too. I mean, we did um, a drain for her because her yard had a big hole where everything was drained into this hole. So we made a new drain pipe and, and decorated and did flowers and bought flowers and <laughs> did all kinds of things. And if, if you can ever go, you should because it's amazing. Thank you. Oh, I'm so proud of Ann because she said she wasn't coming up and then she said she wasn't going to talk. So give her a hand. So anyway, I just want to thank God for the opportunity that he offers all of us here at New Life. There's so many things. You know, once a month, they're, you know, they're, they're highlighting something. Something that you can do, somewhere you can go. Somebody can always do something. You know, I thought I would be the oldest one there. I wasn't. Praise God. I was the oldest lady there. But honestly, what a missions trip of any kind or doing something for anybody, you always get more back than what you think you're able to give. So I highly recommend that sign up to do something Fall in love with Jesus and he'll take care of you and give you whatever it is you need. Boy, it's kind of hard to follow all that. Well, my name is Steve. I've been involved with ASP since 2004 with New Life Up. This is my heart's passion. To see these people right here, four first time people going. You know, God is good. You know, we go there to be a blessing. But you know what? We come back being more blessed than what we bless them with. You know, God moves in us, moves in our heart. So I challenge you, as they did, anybody from 14 years old up to, well, as long as you can get into a van, you know, you're useful. You know, God can use you. We, <laughs> we, we had two gentlemen who was pushing 80 years old who worked hard every day. One day it was 99 degrees, but the heating index probably over 110. You know, my group, which... They were on my group. We did metal on a trailer roof, which was a experimental project, a way the ASB has never done it before. You know, I always ask for the most difficult jobs to challenge me to be able to, to work through the problems. Well, on Tuesday, I was like, God, I don't know if I'm going to ask for this next year, okay? But, you know, God answers your problem. He gives you the wisdom to push through, to make it right, to make these houses and trailers warmer, safer, drier. And that's what our mission is. You know, we are to be Jesus to these people with a sad helping of construction work, you know. And the only thing I can say is, there's no words for this, how God blesses you for this, you know. Uh, in your quiet times in the morning, God speaks to you and gives you things like he, he doesn't do back here for some reason. I guess my mind's too cluttered here. Well, there my mind was open, you know. He gave me an awesome devotion one morning, which this came out of nowhere. You know, I woke up extra early that morning and I went down and did my devotion with nobody around. I said, okay, God, if you want me to share this, you got to make an opening to do it. Well, I go down, look for our morning devotion list and guess what? That day was wide open. I said, okay, Lord, I got the message, you know, but this is the kind of experiences you experience on this. You know, you don't need the ability in construction. There's always something there to be done. You know, whether it's with little children or with older people, ministering to them, you know, just sitting there talking to them. A lot of these people are by themselves, just want the companionship, just want the friendship, you know, to share a meal with. You know, we take lunch for our people who are there, the ones who are willing to, you know, to come out and eat with us. You know, we pray with them. You know, they love it, you know. And through your all's giving and through your prayers, this makes it possible for a team like this to go. So I encourage every one of you all, be listening to the Holy Spirit. You know, if this is something that you want to try, you know, it's only seven days. You know, we leave on Sunday, come back on Saturday. What's seven days? Try it and see what God has for you. If you don't like it, you don't have to do it again next year, but I'm telling you what, you go once, God's going to grab a hold of your heart and he's going to put the desire in there because it's not about building, it's about loving on people. Amen. So, 
Thank you, folks. Give my hands are seated this morning. And if you want to know any more of the details, just talk to Brother Steve. He answers to Gary also. All right. <clears throat> Jesus said something that, when you read it on the surface, it sounds really strange compared to everything else in Christianity. He said this. He said, to him that has shall more be given. To him that has not shall be taken away even that which he seems to have. The reason that sounds strange is it's almost backwards from every other thing that Christianity teaches us to do. But what he was talking about is this, what this group was talking about here. He's saying, if you'll be an available vessel for me to use, and you'll let me use you, and you will go with whatever you have to offer to God to minister, he'll pour more into you. That's what he was saying. He's saying, but if you don't do anything with what you have, guess what? You don't even get to hold on to what you have. Spiritually speaking, you lose what you have. And what they're telling you too here this morning is you can't outgive God. When you just make yourself available, He'll put you in what we call, we talked about it yesterday morning in Saturday morning Bible study, divine appointments. The God of the universe is working in people's hearts and lives to move all of us around, almost like pieces on a chessboard, to put us in the paths of those that we can love and minister to in the name of Jesus. But you got to be willing, like these folks said, step out of your comfort zone. Mark was not only a newbie, the first fellow that spoke, he's not only a newbie to the ASP team, he's a newbie to the praise team. Amen. He came to me, came to me a couple months ago, and, and he said, I think God wants me to step out of my comfort zone. And I said, what's he want you to do? He says, I play guitar. I said, did you ever play on a worship team? He said, nope. He said, but I think God wants me to do it. And here he is doing it. <laughs> and that's what God wants you to do. Just step out of your comfort zone when you feel that nudge of the Holy Spirit. Let Him use you, and He'll pour more into you. Our God is a good steward. He doesn't waste anything. <laughs> he doesn't want to waste you either and all that He's put in you. Would you stand with me, please, in honor of the reading of God's Word this morning? Thank you, ASP team, for being faithful to let God use you. 1 Samuel chapter 14, I want to continue to look at Saul and Jonathan's life. Saul was the first king of Israel. Jonathan was his son. And in 1 Samuel 14, it says this, verse 16, Saul's watchman in Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude melted away and went hither and thither. If you remember when I spoke last week, Jonathan had taken his armor bearer while the army of Israel was hiding from the Philistines, Jonathan, Saul's son, had taken his armor bearer, and he went out to these particular rocks in this crag, and he was looking at the enemy through them, and he sought the face of God, and God told him, he gave him a sign, he said, if this happens, you go in, I'm going to deliver them to you. And Jonathan had started a conflict, if you will, with the Philistines that the Israel's uh, army was afraid of. But now, Saul's watchmen are looking out and they're seeing what's taking place. They're seeing the army of the Philistines is in disarray. And he said, Saul's watchman in Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, this multitude melted away and went hither and thither. Then Saul said to the men with him, number and see who's gone from us. When they numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were missing. Because if you'll remember, Jonathan had not told his dad that he was going to do this. Saul said to Ahijah, Bring here the ark of God, for at the time the ark of God was with the children of Israel. While Saul talked to the priests, the tumult in the Philistine camp kept increasing. And then Saul said to the priests, withdraw your hand. I want to talk to you about the inspiration of faith and courage this morning. If God can get a hold of one person who will believe and trust in God, the world can change. 
John Wesley, the great Methodist preacher who would roll over in his grave if he saw most of the Methodist church today, he said one time, he said, if you will give me a hundred men that fear nothing but God, I'll turn the world upside down. God, Jonathan said to his armor bearer, he said, God can save with many or few, but he chooses to work through us. He chooses to work through people. Second Chronicles tells us that the eyes of the Lord are moving to and fro throughout the earth, that he might find the one whose heart is completely his. He said, I will fully support them. If you want God's support, in everything you do, simple plan. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, and nothing, nothing that God wants done will be impossible for you. Amen? <laughs> Bow your heads with me, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come before your throne again this morning. Thank you for another beautiful summer Lord's Day to be able to assemble openly in your house to assemble with the freedom that we have, Father, to lift up our hearts, our lives, our songs, our prayers, our ministry to you, that we might worship you and give thanks for all that you have done for each and every one of us. Father, help us to be always mindful, not only of the bigger things that you've done, but every little thing that you have given us breath and life and strength and the ability, Lord God, to be in your house this morning. Father, be in the homes and the sick beds of those that are unable because of the physical diseases and the rack and the pain in their body this morning to be with us. We pray, God, that you would turn their, their hospital rooms, their bedrooms into a sanctuary this morning. Let your Holy Spirit hover over them, touch them, heal them, give them grace and strength, and most of all, Father, draw their hearts to you. Lord, we thank you for our church family. We know that many of them are traveling on the highways and the byways and the airways and the waterways, that we are in that season, Father, where we need times of physical rest and refreshing. And, and Lord, we just pray that you'd be with them. We pray, God, wherever they're at, if they're on the, a beach or in a church sanctuary, God, turn it into a sanctuary for them. Draw near to them, Father, and help them. We also ask that you would just give everyone traveling mercies and set your angels round about them. And Father, we thank you for the presence of your Spirit in this house this morning. God, there are people here that are on the edge of just falling off in life. And we pray, God, that you would strengthen them, that you would encourage them, that, Lord, that you would help them to see your presence. Give them strength where there is no strength. Father, there are others that are troubled in heart and mind. Father, give them that peace that passes all understanding. Help them to know that there is a place for them in their Father's house. God, we have loved ones that are lost. We have loved ones, Lord, that have no thought of you this morning. We pray that wherever they're at, whatever they're doing, that you would just interrupt them for a little bit. Let that still, small voice speak to them and call them home to their Father, I pray. God, I pray for every family represented by every person in this room that, Lord, you would let the bloodhound of heaven, your Holy Spirit, just continue to reach out to them, Father. God, we are living in these last days. We are in perilous times. You said men would be lovers of themselves, haters of God, haters of things that are good and proud and boastful. And Father, we truly are in these days, but help us to be faithful to you. Give us strength and courage and help us to stand up as men and women and children of God and help us to accomplish your will, we pray, Father. And Lord, everyone that is in agreement with that prayer in Jesus' name said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you this morning. We're really looking at the contrast between King Saul and his son Jonathan. I, I love being a minister for a lot of different reasons, but one of them is, is to be able to take the Word of God and so in a microscopic way be able to look at some of these stories. I've read the Bible so many times I've lost count of how many times I've read it, but when you're able to take the time that you allow me, and thanks by the way for allowing me to be a pastor and a full-time minister and supporting that ministry, when you do that it allows me to see things that I wouldn't be able to see otherwise. And I've read this story many, many times and never realized before that 
Really, Jonathan represents someone living a life by the Spirit and walking by the Spirit in contrast to King Saul, who is just constantly walking by the flesh. He's the leader and the king of Israel, but unfortunately, he will not obey God. He continues to try to do the work of God and the will of God, but he tries to do it in his own strength and in his own flesh, and you cannot do that. You cannot even live the Christian life in your own willpower and in your own strength. Now, it does take your will. You've got to make a decision somewhere that you choose God every time in every situation. But even then, if you try to do that on your own, you're going to fail. But if you'll get your heart and your life right with God, God's Spirit will empower you, will enable you to say yes to God. And what a contrast it is. Saul's following his own misguided flesh while Jonathan is following the Lord. Saul's army is decreasing in strength and number. He started out with 6,000, now he was down to 600. So when he sees the enemy beginning to flee in front of Jonathan, he just sees them doing this. They're, they're in disarray. He doesn't know what's going on, and he's wondering who of the Israelites is responsible for it. So he has his men count who's left, and they realize at this point that Jonathan and his armor bearer are among the missing. And Saul knows he's in trouble, and he calls for the priest and the Ark of the Covenant. Now, you know, Saul's old enough, you would have thought he would have heard about Eli and his sons. Remember, they went out against the Philistines. They didn't obey God. They weren't walking in a relationship with God, but they were practicing religion. So what they decided to do was take the Ark of the Covenant out of the tabernacle, and they took the Ark of the Covenant and put it out into battle because they thought the power of God was in the Ark. It's not. The power of God's never in a trinket. The power of God's in a man or woman of God that loves Him enough to keep and obey His Word. That's where the power of God is. But Saul still doesn't get that, so he calls for the priest and he brings the Ark of the Covenant in again. It didn't save Eli and his sons, and it won't save Saul. Religion will not save you. A relationship with Jesus Christ will. You say, well, what's the difference? Religion is you do the same thing that all Christians do. You go to church, you read your Bible, you pray, you might even give money in the offering. You just never really obey God and live for Him. You just do all the religious things. That's what religion is. What is a relationship with Christ? You read your Bible, you go to church, you pray, you talk to God, and you walk with God. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And if you keep my commandments, my Father and I will come to you and manifest ourselves to you. And it won't be just religion, and it won't be just about a book. You know, Jesus said another strange thing to the scribes and Pharisees. He said, you search the Scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. But he said, you won't come to me that you might have life. I hate to tell you this, but it's true, and history's proved it. You can read this Bible and memorize it, but without a relationship with God, it'll turn you into a devil. Yeah. The Bible is not a talisman. It's not a trinket. It's not an idol. It is the Word of God to reveal to you how to get into a relationship with God so He can use it to communicate to you so you can grow in that relationship, learn to hear His voice, and never follow another. <laughs> but by itself, it's just paper and ink. And for a lot of people, it's paper, ink, and a lot of dust because they never crack it open. I'll never forget, I was in a conference one time with Dave Wilkerson, and he was talking about one of the books in the Old Testament. He said, I want you to turn to the white pages. And I thought, what in the world is he talking about? He said, hold your Bible up. He said, you got a bunch of pages and books you never read, and if you look, the edge of it's white because you've never touched it. Uh-huh. Even the Bible will rat you out if you're not careful. <laughs> now, this is the really crazy thing. Saul starts to call upon the Lord, but he doesn't wait on the Lord. How many of you know you can call upon the Lord and not wait on the Lord? 
You know, you put your head down, close your eyes, say one of them headache prayers, and then go do what you want to do anyway. That's what a lot of people do. <laughs> That's what Saul was doing here. He starts to seek the Lord because he realized there's a tumult in the Philistine camp. He seeks on the Lord, but he doesn't wait on him. He tells the priest. What he does, picture this. He calls the priest to bring the Ark of the Covenant. They bring it in. He's saying, look, there's a tumult out here in the camp, and we better seek God. But then the tumult really gets bad. He says, oh, forget it. Forget that. Let's just, let's just go out there and do our thing. And that's exactly what he does. Saul, when you look at his life, has no patience. His biggest problem is, is he cannot wait for God to lead him. He cannot wait for God to guide him. He cannot wait. He just can't. And he moves on. Is it any wonder that Jesus said, in your patience, possess ye your souls? I want to tell you this morning, we get in trouble when we won't wait <laughs> on God. See, what happened was Saul looked out and he saw, man, the battle started. And God, I want to take the time to wait on you, but you know what? The battle's out here. The enemy is, you know, there's, there's a fight in the camp. And I'm sorry, Lord, but I'm going to go out and deal with it. I can't wait any longer. It's, it's already started. That's what he did. He didn't want to wait on Samuel, and he doesn't want to wait on God. And because of those two things, he doesn't obey God either, either time. It really should speak to our hearts. Now, there's a lot of things in life that God's Word will speak to you in. You know, people say all the time, I don't know what the will of God is. Well, read it. <laughs> Most of your life, He's already told you what the will of God is for most of it. Now, there are some things that He will lead you to do and places He wants to take you and things He wants to accomplish in you and through you that He will speak to you about individually. But even then, you've got to wait on the Lord. You've got to wait on the Lord. I like what Isaiah 40, verse 28 says, and we love to read it because it sounds so poetic. Have you not known, have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not grow faint or grow weary, and there's no searching of His understanding? How many of you know God sees all, knows all, understands all? Now, we know that in church, but have you ever been out in the middle of life? Have you ever been in a circumstance or situation where you thought, God, uh, I'm down here. Do you realize I'm here and in this mess? <laughs> you ever felt like that? God, are you sure you didn't blink or go to sleep or something here? Uh, you can take it to the bank. He does not sleep. He does not slumber. He that keeps Israel. <laughs> it's a good thing because you get about, you know, 16, 18 hours ahead of the devil and then you go to sleep and he doesn't. And the time you get up, he's caught up with you again. But he never outruns God. See, the word of the Lord says there's no searching of his understanding. He doesn't faint. He doesn't grow weary. I've been saying it for years. There's one word God has never said, oops. <laughs> Nothing takes him by surprise. Us Pentecostals, we like to do things spontaneously, don't we? We'll say, no, nah, I'm not going to plan a Sunday school lesson. I'm not going to plan a worship service. We're just going to show up and wait for the Spirit to lead us. Really? Now, there's a lot to be said for spontaneity because sometimes we can miss it and God does want to lead us in a different direction. But don't you know we're serving a God that laid out the plan of the universe thousands of years before it happened? Don't use spontaneity for laziness. Don't use spontaneity in the spirit to cover procrastination. Don't, 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 you know, don't do stupid stuff and blame it on God. That's what I'm trying to say to you. God plans things way out. The God that can help you do something in this moment could have told you five years ago to do it in this moment. It's not all spontaneity. It says, he gives power to the faint and the weary, and to him who has no might, he increases strength, causing it to multiply 
and making it to abound. Well, the whole world came down around me this week. I don't think I'm going to church. Really? Really? How many times do I have to say it to you? When it goes south, run to God. Don't run away from God. So, well, I really blew it this week, man. I didn't act nothing like a Jesus child, and I, you know, nothing like my father, and I'm just, I just soon not even go to church. That's what the devil wants. He don't want you to show up for that ministry. He don't want you to go to church. He don't want you to be in Bible study. He don't want you to do ministry to other people. He just wants you to sit down and quit. But you need to run toward God. Why? Because he gives strength to the weary. He gives power to the faint. You got to get plugged in and get plugged in good and get plugged in solid. Your whole life will change. I don't know anybody that half attends church that lives Christianity. I don't know anybody outside of the church. They profess to live Christianity. They never grow. They never mature. They never amount to anything in God. Why? Because we need each other and we need God. Jesus said, if two or three will come together in my name, I'll show up. There's power. There's strength. There is wisdom and direction. There is everything you need. We sing songs, Jesus, you're enough. And then we run to this fountain, and we run to that cistern, and we run to this place and that place. If he's really enough, why don't you just come here and let him do what he told you to do? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll have to give in the ties if I keep coming. I keep hearing that every week. No, but you'll run to the doctor, slap down $150, $200, $300, and then go home and not even do what he told Hello. <laughs> he gives strength. Even you shall faint and be weary. Young men shall feebly stumble and fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord, who expect for, look for, hope in him, shall change and renew their strength and power. Whew. I've come to church and I've done ministry and I've walked with God at times where I about had to crawl in here. <laughs> A lot of times here, the older I get, the more I got to crawl. <laughs> but you know what? He never lets you down. He never fails. I've got up out of that chair over there, felt so bad, I thought I'd probably faint before I got done. I get up here and God turns the gas on. He puts the fire on. Now, Carla might have to nurse me after we get home on Sunday afternoon. She does a lot. But, but what I'm telling you is God will not fail you. Listen to what he says. It says, those who wait for the Lord, look for, hope in him, shall change and renew their strength and power. They shall lift their wings and mount up close to God as eagles. Mount up to the sun. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint or become tired. Don't we love to quote that stuff? Yeah, but you got to live that stuff. <laughs> and that's what Jonathan was doing. Saul was walking after his flesh, trying to do everything in his own strength, and Jonathan was just the opposite. He waited on God, he obeyed God, and because he did, he inspired people to do the will of God. That's the awesome thing about it. I like what Paul says to Timothy in one place. He said, Timothy, he said, if you will continue in the teaching, in the doctrine that I have given unto you, and you'll be faithful to teach it to others, he said, you will save yourself and those that hear you. Can I tell you, if you'll live for God, you won't be the only one that gets saved out of the deal. Don't be the stumbling block. Don't be the professing Christian who stumbles everybody that looks at you because you don't live what you talk. Live what you talk and let God use you and let him save other people through you. There are people watching you that you don't even know. There are people that you will help lead to heaven that you have never even made eye contact with in this world, and you will see them at the judgment seat of Christ, and they'll say, I saw your life. You were here. You were there. You did this. You did that. You built me some steps. You built me a ramp. Whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God and let God use you. You want to change the world? Just get your heart right with God and then just live your everyday life as worship to God. Well, the story goes on. It said, then Saul and all the people with him rallied, and they went into the battle. You know, they've been hiding. Saul's afraid. He won't wait on God, but he sees what Jonathan has done and what's going on in the enemy's camp. 
And so he rallies the men that he has, and they go into the battle. And it said, and behold, every Philistine sword was against his fellow in wild confusion. Remember last week, God brought an earthquake. He brought an earthquake. He brought thunder. He brought lightning. God will fight your battles if you'll be faithful to God and just let him use you. Now it said, moreover, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines, traitors, they're traitors. They were Jews, but they said, well, the Philistines are more powerful. Our army's hiding. Where do you think those, you know, 6,000, what was it, 5,600 men or 400 men, 5,400 men went over to the enemy's camp. Boy, that's a sermon. Judas sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. I've seen people sell him for less. Come to church, give your heart to Christ, walk with Christ, serve Christ for a while, but man, some, some one or something comes along, buddy. All that's out the window. God don't mean nothing to you. A lot of times it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Yeah, you look, you look like David going after Goliath until they show up and you're like, whoa. And they don't love God and they don't serve God and as soon as you get yourself hooked up to them, out the door they go and you go with them. That's right. And some even for a lot less than that. These Hebrews were with the Philistines before that time. They went up into the camp to them from the country roundabout. Said even they also turned to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. That's the trouble with traitors. You can't trust them with anybody or anything. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> They're in the middle of the battle, and, and these Jews that had turned traitors on Israel, now they turn on the Philistines. It says, likewise, all the men of Israel had hid themselves in the hill country of Ephraim. When they heard that the Philistines fled, they also went after them in hot pursuit in the battle. So the Lord delivered Israel that day. The battle passed beyond Beth Avon. Everybody wants to come to the party when you're winning. <laughs> <laughs> Twelve years ago, we were in a church building in Clear Spring. We had went up there with 400 people. Eleven years before, we were down to about 150, 160 people. When I went up there, I had three, four full-time staff people, paid staff on staff. The church had whittled down, and I had to lay all of them off except my secretary that's still with us. And I said, I said to the leadership of our church, I said, we got to do something. We got to get out of here. I said, the church is dying. We can see it on paper and it's just going downhill. I said, we got to go somewhere. We came down here. We found this lovely building. We didn't know if we could get in here or not, but I said, we got to get somewhere around that mall. I said, people won't come to Clear Spring. They don't like to go to Boonesburg unless they live there. They don't like to go to Smithburg unless they live there. But I said, everybody in this city will go to the Valley Mall. I said, we got to get somewhere close to that Valley Mall. We come down, we found this building, the church voted to come here. We got down here, we came in, we built this platform and all that stuff back here. And we get all this stuff in here and we're set up to have church. We come in to have music practice on Thursday night and the inspectors, city inspectors come in here like a SWAT team. Twelve of them with jackets, look like the FBI. They said, you can't have church here, you can't be in this building. He said, this thing isn't zoned for a church. You cannot be in here. You got to get all that stuff out of here. We had to take all this stuff out of here and put it in sea containers out in the driveway out there in the parking lot. And then it started. Well, you know, Pastor Ken, if this was really the will of God, this wouldn't be happening. If God was really in this, blah, blah, blah. We wrestled for almost six weeks with the county inspectors to try to get in here to get things set up. We set this church up three different times and they come in and say, get it out. And a lot of people said, can't be God, Pastor Ken. This wouldn't be happening if it was God. I went home one night, I said, I'm starting to know how Joshua and Caleb felt after they came back <laughs> from viewing the promised land. My wife said, what do you think's happening? I said, well, I said, if this thing pans out, they'll follow me to the moon. I said, if it don't, they won't follow me to Walmart. 
I said, everything's on the line. We'd already sold the other church and whatnot. And there were people saying, man, I don't know if we're going to do this. Six weeks went by. Finally, it got so bad that the owners of the building, they called me and they said, can you come down to a meeting? We're going to talk to the county commissioner. I said, yeah, I'll go to a meeting with you. I get down there and there's seven or eight of us sitting around the table and, and uh, county commissioner gets the head inspector on the telephone. He's on his cell phone, on a speakerphone. He don't know we're all sitting around his table. And county commissioner says, well, I've, I've, I've got the owner of the building down here and I've got his workman down here and this guy just starts going, on. I ain't full of them people. I've been down there five times. I ain't getting in that building. We ain't signing off. We ain't doing nothing. County commissioner puts his hand over the phone and he looks at me and he said, will you go over to this man's office with me and talk to him? I said, yeah, I ain't afraid of him. I'll go talk. So we get in the car, the other people waiting there, and we go over to his office, we walk in. Now, I've never said this to the county commissioner, but the county commissioner walks in this guy's office and he says, this is Pastor Harris. And he's got a church over here of 400 people. I thought, I didn't tell you that, and we don't have a church of 400 right now. He said, he's got a church of 400 people. He said, you and I have public meetings every week. He said, I don't think you want all 400 of them showing up on the sidewalk down at the courthouse this week. And I thought, oh, my goodness. I thought, this guy's going to throw me out the door, and everything's done. The guy said, well, we need you to do this, and we need you to do that, and we need you to do the other thing. And then the county commissioner looked at me, and he said, Pastor Harris, is there anything you want to say to this guy? I said, yeah, I do. And this is what I said to him. I said, if you will tell us what to do. I said, if you tell me to stand on my head, I'll stand on my head. If you tell me not to, I won't. But I said, somebody has to tell us exactly what we're supposed to do for six weeks. They would come in and tell us something, we'd do it. They'd come in and say, nope, that ain't what we want, we want something else. I said, somebody needs to know what they're doing. Now, we were doing all this work, the church was. We painted this church building in, I think, in a day. We painted this whole sanctuary one time. Got a lot of stuff ready in here. We were trying to do it all ourselves to save money so that we could afford to be in here. The inspector looks at me and the commissioner. He said, well... He said, if you can get this done today and you can get this done tomorrow, he said, we'll sign off on it and let you get in this weekend. We left his office. We went back to the commissioner's office and the owners of the building were there. We told him what it said. The owner of the building looked at me. He said, why don't you let me send my crew in and let them redo this thing and let them set it up. And I'm thinking, oh, here goes all our money because we're going to have to pay The last, they came in and did it, set it all up. We were in here that following Thursday. We've been in here ever since for 12 years. The last bill I saw that was given to the owners of the building, they had invested $190,000 in getting this building ready to go. I said, oh, no, that's every penny that we have. You know what? They ate every bit of it. The owners of the building never asked us for a dime. We still have that money in the bank 12 years later that we thought we were going to have to remodel this building with. Then guess what everybody was saying? Oh, Pastor Ken, you mighty man of God. This is God. We love this place. We just think this is the most wonderful thing that's ever happened. I thought, yeah, right. But I really did. I understand but I just wanted you to see a picture. It only takes somebody with a little bit of faith, somebody with a little bit of trust in God, and you can get just about anything done. Amen. Now, my mother knew me better than you did, and when I got saved, I went first day I got saved and told her I got saved, she said, I'll give you three weeks. And she was being generous, because I almost backslid two days later. <laughs> But I'm telling you, God is a faithful God. Everybody likes a winner. That's why you need to sell out and live for God. You need to sell out and love God and let God bless you. He said, I will show the world that you have my favor if you'll just walk with me. If you'll just walk with me. 
But unfortunately, Saul's impetuousness and his disobedience continues. Look what this fool does. He said, but the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had caused them to take an oath, saying, Cursed be the man who eats any food before evening, until I've taken vengeance on my enemies. So none of the men tasted any food. How many of you know what an army runs on? If you don't, you, you're really young, because the Romans figured it out 2,000 years ago. They said, man, they run on their stomach. You got to feed them. <laughs> If you want soldiers to be strong and do what they're supposed to, you got to keep them healthy. Not Saul. Said, and all the people of the land came to a wood and there was honey on the ground. <laughs> when the men entered the wood, behold, the honey was dripping, but no man tasted it, for the men feared the oath. <laughs> See, when people walk by the flesh, and particularly when they're in leadership, they got to control things, don't they? And one of the first things they start doing is making a bunch of rules. And in this case, the rules that he made thwarted the blessing of God. Where do you think that honey came from? Here's an army that needs to eat. They're in the middle of nowhere fighting their enemies. And guess who put honey on the ground? <laughs> That's a word picture too. The rest of the world is starved. You're in the desert. The enemy's eating your lunch. And God says, I'll provide honey out of the rock for you if you walk with me. If you'll do my will. Only problem was they were all afraid to eat it because if the king gave an oath of something and you didn't listen to it, they'd put you to death. He said, but Jonathan had not heard when his father charged the people with the oath, so he dipped the end of his rod into his hand into a honeycomb and put it to his mouth, and his weary eyes brightened. See, God will give the weary strength, but sometimes you just got to do what God provides, right? Charlotte and I were having a little talk before church started today about Sometimes when we need rest and, you know, the devil, devil tries to keep pushing you all the time. If he can't get you to sit down and do nothing, he'll put you up on top of the pinnacle and push, push, push. He'll tell you, you ain't done enough and you need to go. You need to run. You need to do all this. And Charlotte and I don't listen good, so God slaps us down every once in a while. Right? That's right. I said to my staff about two months ago on a Wednesday morning, I said, I don't know if I'm going to make it to vacation. I said, I am so wore out. I've done 18, 19 funerals at that point, and I said, between them and the church services and everything else that's going on, I said, man, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I need to take a break. They said, well, why don't you take the time off? I said, I can't. Saturday morning, I was down with COVID. God says, I think you can. <laughs> you say, really, God do that? I guarantee you God would do that. When you won't stop, you're foolish. He'll say, I, I know how to stop you. Fool. I got all full of myself back in 1981. I was a name it, claim it, blab it, and grab it, telling everybody how to live for God. God said, oh, yeah, let me, let me put you down on your back for two months. You can't even turn over into bed. Let's see what kind of man of faith and power you are now. My pastor that I had at the time, him and his wife come visit me. They, they were trying not to be because they were loving people. They looked like vultures going around my bed. They so tickled I was down, they couldn't hardly stand it. He was trying not to show it, but they did. He said, we've been trying to tell you. I said, I know, I got it. I got it. Jonathan, it said, then one of the men told him, your father strictly charged the men with an oath saying, curse be the man who eats any food today. And the people were exhausted and faint. Then Jonathan said, my father has troubled the land. See how my eyes have brightened because I tasted a little of this honey? How much better if the men had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies when, which they found? For now the slaughter of the Philistines has not been great. Saul and Jonathan both will die at the hands of the Philistines that they could have defeated that day and been done with. Saul would spend his entire reign trying to fight the Philistines in his own strength. And it would not only cost him his life and the kingdom and eternity, but it would cost Jonathan his life as well. It said, they smote the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ajalon, and the people were very faint. They weren't able to totally defeat the Philistines. 
And see, a lot of times God provides everything that we need to totally defeat our enemies. And yet, if we're not careful, we will refuse the provision because we want God to do things our way. How many of you know God rarely does anything the way we want it done? I don't want to shock you. I don't want to blow your boat out of the water, but I'm telling you very seldom is he going to do it your way, but he is faithful. It said, when night came and the oath expired, the men flew upon the spoil. They took sheep, ox, and calves, slew them on the ground, and ate them raw with the blood. How many of you ever fasted a whole day taking nothing? I'm not talking about you fasted from bubble gum or you fasted from chocolate or whatever this goofy stuff people are doing today. I'm talking about you went without food. I've gone without food for three days. You can smell a refrigerator at 50 yards with the door closed. <laughs> when I was younger, I went and fast and I was just hitchhiking and didn't have enough to eat. I drank. I drank out of a mud hole and ate those little bitty corn, you know, that hadn't grown yet. They're good in Chinese. They are not good raw. <laughs> yeah, I know. Some of you cook three different meals for all your kids. You know what my mother used to say? She said, you get hungry enough, you eat it. If there's any left. There were seven of us, so... <laughs> If you didn't get it quick, you wouldn't get nothing. We learned to eat a lot of things we didn't particularly care for. See, that's what happened. These men have fought a battle all day, and they are so hungry that now they're killing the livestock that they, that they have captured, but they're eating it with blood. They're eating it raw. Exactly what God told them to never do in the book of Leviticus. See, that's trouble. Just like you can inspire people by your godliness, how many of you know you don't live and sin by yourself either. When you don't live for God, it isn't just about you and what you do wrong. You influence the people that are around you. See, I believe when we stand before God one day, we are either going to have lived for God and been a blessing to all humanity, or we are going to have lived for ourselves and our flesh and the devil and been a curse to all humanity, not just to us. We've contributed to the sea of sin of humanity. God wants you to contribute to the sea of righteousness in humanity. That's why sometimes we feel like I am insignificant, I am small, my life isn't making any difference. It is. It's like a rock thrown in a pond that the ripples are going out and touching people that you don't even see and don't even know. And the Bible said it can do that across generations as well as the people in the day and hour in which you live. It is a fearful thing to have the gift of life. It's also a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God if your heart and your life has not served Him. And see, Saul had caused these men to sin. Saul said, disperse yourselves among the people, tell them, bring me every man his ox, his sheep, and butcher them here and eat, and sin not against the Lord by eating the blood. So all the men brought each one his own ox that night, and they butchered it there. And Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first altar that he built to the Lord. If he would have just learned how to walk with God. How many of you know you can have an altar, and it won't make a bit of difference in your life? Saying prayers may not mean a thing if your heart and your life isn't right with God. It said, then Saul said, let us go down after the Philistines by night and seize and plunder them until daylight, and let us not leave a man of them. And they said, do whatever seems good to you. And then the priest said, let us draw near here to God. I want you to notice the priest is still trying to pull Saul in. He's like, Saul, let's don't just run down here and do this thing. Let, let's, let's talk to God about it. And Saul asked counsel of God, shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he did not answer him that day. <sighs> when God won't talk to you, how many of you know you're in trouble? Because <laughs> he is long-suffering and merciful and forgiving, but he has a limit too. I love my first pastor used to say this. He said, if you're praying and you can't find God and you can't hear God, guess who moved? God didn't move, you moved. 
No, he got no answer from God. Why? Because God's not our genie in the bottle. He's not the person we just call up and get to do tricks for us, fix stuff for us. You got to be in a relationship with God. Then Saul said, draw near all the chiefs of the people and let us see how this sin is causing God's silence arose today. For as the Lord lives who delivers Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, I, he shall surely die, but not a man among all the people answered. That's the other thing about flesh. God won't talk to you and guess whose fault it is. Anybody but mine. My third grade teacher. It was my parents. It was my uncle. It was anybody but me. He knows God isn't talking to him. He knows there's a problem. But instead of looking at himself, he says, well, we'll just find out who, who's the problem here. See, that's a problem with religion and that's a problem with flesh. It started in the garden. Eve, why'd you eat that apple? The serpent deceived me. Adam, why'd you eat that apple? Lord, the woman you gave me, she made me eat that apple. It started back then and it ain't quit. I'm telling you. Few and far between are people that alone up and be responsible for their own decisions. Do you know even in church, even in our church, the copier can get broken, nobody did it? This got gone and nobody took it. It just walked out the door on its own. Don't leave nothing laying around, it's community property. <laughs> you said in church? Yeah. 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 Why? Because it's that fallen nature. It's that fallen nature. You have the same thing on your job. You have the same thing everywhere you go. Somebody can have a car wreck with you. They can run through an intersection and T-bone you. But when the cops get there, whose fault is it? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just flesh. That's the way flesh is. See, in true to form, Saul blames others for the fact that God's not speaking to him. And he makes a foolish and deadly proclamation. He's going to put to death whoever he thinks is responsible for it. Even if, and he even says it, even if it's my own son. I mean, that's nasty stuff. See, the Bible tells us even these last days, it said even parents will not have the natural affection for kids. You wonder why so many kids in the world today suffer like they do? It's because we're almost next to animals. Do things that they do. But the difference here is the people themselves are going to intervene. God uses the people to intervene and save Jonathan. Saul said to Jonathan, Saul prays and he asks God. He don't wait on God to say anything, but he says, I want you, God, to give me a true lottery. We're going to put all the people on one side and Jonathan and I on the other side, and we're going to draw lots, and you're going to show us who it is. And they draw the lots, and the people are free, and now it's down to Jonathan and Saul. They draw lots again, and it comes down to Jonathan. And so Saul's ready to put him to death. He said, Jonathan, tell me what you've done. And John said, I've tasted a little honey with the end of the rod that was in my hand, and behold, I must die. There's a lot of crimes that the Bible says we need to put to death for, but I don't think eating honey is one of them. <laughs> especially when God put it there. But the people said to Saul, shall Jonathan, who's wrought this great deliverance to Israel, die? God forbid. As the Lord lives, there shall not one hair of his head perish, for he's wrought this great deliverance with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, and he did not die. If God be for you, who can be against you? Not even your daddy. <laughs> so what do we learn from all this? Well, as the praise team comes to the platform, I'm going to share with you. We learn that people try to keep up a pretense of serving God. All they do is follow their own flesh, and their pretense turns into a religious form with no power that only ends up destroying and hurting the one who practices it and everyone else that it touches. You say, well... I do most of what God wants me to do. I want to close reading this scripture. Jesus said, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. 
Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Jesus was telling us and the people of his day who were about to crucify him, they were about to torture him, they were about to crucify him, his image and who he was was about to be so marred he would not even be recognizable. And he was letting them know they could do all of that and more to him. But when the Holy Spirit came to convict their hearts, to draw them to God, if they resisted him, there would be no hope. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit isn't making fun of tongues or it isn't making fun of something that God's done. It's resisting the Holy Spirit your whole life. And if you do that in this life, you can't be saved. You must be born again. And there will be no forgiveness in the afterlife. It'll be too late then. You say, well, why are you ending with this? Simply this. Be a Jonathan. Don't be a King Saul. Be a Jonathan whose inspiration of faith and courage in God inspired others to follow him and win the battle. Be a Jonathan. Don't be a King Saul. Don't live by your flesh. Don't practice religion without a heart that loves and obeys God. You're, you suffer and everybody around you will suffer and it will su you will suffer all through life and so will the people that your life touches. Be a Jonathan. Be a Jonathan. You say, well, he wasn't king. Nope. In the grand scope of things, he was nobody. In the grand scope of things, we're nobody. But our lives can make a difference if we will live for God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. If we'll quit playing games, if we'll quit fudging, if we'll listen to the Word of God and the voice of God and do what He tells us to do. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Stand. We're going to worship the Lord. These altars are always open for you to seek the Lord. There's others here. We have prayer teams, people that will pray with you. Don't leave this house if you need to touch the face and the heart of God this morning. To dismiss us in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, for this service here today. We can lift praises and honor up to you. And let us remember that you do reign. <clears throat> you reign forever. You always will reign. And everything to come and all the years to come, forever you'll be reigning with us. We ask that you uh, be with us as we go this week. We ask you to put an edge of protection around us. And be with everyone who hasn't been here today and keep them close to you and put a hedge of protection around them as they doing what they have to do or they're traveling and going on vacation and all the vacations coming up, we ask you to put a hedge of protection around us as we travel. And um, we ask that you uh, put upon our hearts that we be more like Jonathan, not like Saul, that we put our trust in you and our trust in you alone because only you are worthy of our praise and our honor and our trust. We ask that you be with us as we fight our battles and that we put our trust in you and our battles. And we ask that uh, you um, bless us this week and we ask for all these things in the name of your son and may you receive all the glory and honor for everything we do. Amen. Amen. Amen.